Good evening, everybody. Um, happy second to last day of class, although for all the students that I've talked to, this seems to be the last day of class. Who has classes on Fridays? So I don't know. Is, is, that, is that true in uh, Maryland as well? Only yeah. sections. Only sections. Um, so for those of you who I don't know, I'm Gerald Cohen. I'm the chief economist of the Keenan Institute. And I want to welcome you to today's talk by Professor John Altwanger, one of our Keenan Institute Distinguished Fellows for 2023. Each calendar year, we pick a topic relevant to businesses and policymakers and do a deep dive. We call it our grand challenge. And this year, our topic is workforce disrupted, which analyzes the dramatic changes in what businesses and employees, what businesses are asking employees and what employees are asking of businesses. Thanks to the support of Bruce and Katie Von Sahn, the Keenan Institute has the honor of hosting Professor John Altwanger. John is the Dudley and Louisa Dillard Professor of Economics at the University of Maryland, where he has taught since 1990. He has played a major role in developing and studying US longitudinal firm, da firm level data, some of which we, were, we are using at the Keenan Institute and uh, Keenan Flagler Business School, as, you, as well as UNC in general. We had a very fun for me, maybe not so fun for the non-technical folks, lunch talking about this data. Um, using this data, John has developed new statistical measures and analyzed the determinants of business formation, job creation, job destruction, and economic performance. We'll have an hour together, or roughly an hour, and we will leave time for questions, but if you have one, please hold it until after John's formal remarks. So with that in mind, John, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you. So it's, it's very nice to be at the University of North Carolina. I'll, I'll say I have a somewhat of a personal connection to this place. My father's an alumni of UNC from back in the late 40s. My, my parents grew up in Lexington, North Carolina and Winston-Salem, uh, North Carolina and still have extended family. So uh, I think I've been to UNC Chapel Hill when I was a kid. My dad wanted to bring me over to where he, where he graduated from. So. I'll make sure I do have time for questions and so on. I want to talk about, I think, in many ways, a remarkable change. Uh, I actually think a change for the positive that's, that's been induced by the pandemic uh, that's long lasting, that's, that's not just pandemic related, but, but a structural change that's on the, ongoing in the, in the US economy uh, that surprised many of us, myself including somebody who work, has been working on this for, and you'll see why I'm surprised in just a second. There has been, I'll show you, an, an, I'll say an apparent, and I'll make it clear what I mean by apparent, a surge in new business formation in the United States that, that, that sort of has, has undone a decline in entrepreneurship that's been ongoing for the last couple of decades. And it very much started in, in the midst of the pandemic, and at first, at first is when you, you'll see this in the data, at first we, lots of us thought, well, we, got, we all have a lot of time on our hands, uh, people are thinking about changing their lives and so on, sitting at home, and maybe they're thinking about creating businesses, and so maybe this is sort of a different time. But, but as I'll show you in just a second, uh, this surge has persisted through literally now. So let me walk you through this evidence. So the way this talk's gonna go is, first a little bit of a prologue about well, what things looked like before the pandemic, then this a remarkable surge, and then, and then we'll try to figure out, okay, what's going on? And it's related precisely to the, to the points that Gerald raised is I, there's, a, there's restructuring going on in the US economy associated with the increased working from home, advances to new technology and the like. And I think all those are at play. And I'll talk about uh, how I think they're at play. Um, some of that's very speculative, but I think this new data uh, sheds light on it. So here's the prologue. So, I, I'm somebody who's been studying business startups for a very long time and helped help develop the data sets to track this. This is from a data set the Census Bureau puts out. I actually helped create this data set with, with Census staff. I don't want to claim it, but I'm an advisory. It's called the Business Dynamic Statistics. It's really, I think, the gold standard data for tracking business um, uh, startups uh, that actually are truly new firms. So, you know, what, what, what's the challenges? The statistical agencies quickly track pretty quickly track when they see a new establishment show up. But some, first they need to kind of verify, well, wait a second, is this just somebody 
who's changed ownership, right? So it's, it's, it, it looks like a new establishment because it's got a new ad employer identification number. It's paying under a different account. So, so they first got to figure out whether it's an, truly a new, a, a, new biz, a new establishment. And then they got to go figure out whether this new establishment is part of an existing firm. And you say, how hard does that take? It actually takes a while. So why am I, why am I kind of leading with some of that, that nerdy kind of measurement stuff? Because it turns out the latest gold standard data that we have for true business startups is currently in the US is through just March 2020, right before the pandemic. And I'm showing you some of that data here. It's from this uh, business dynamic statistics. And I'm showing you an indicator of entrepreneurship. You could literally look at the startup rate. I actually find it somewhat more useful to think about how much ec economic activity is accounted for by young businesses. So this is the share of employment in the entire United States, covering literally the entire US private sector at young firms. And you can see, if you look, the thing you probably notice immediately is everything seems to be trending down. Okay, and, and if you look at the red line on the left, it's, that's the economy wide. And so for decades, we've seen this decline in entrepreneurial activity. Um, the, the question is what, you know, what's going on? And I, and I think this is, a, this is a case where one size doesn't fit all. So some of this, if you look carefully, there's some sectors like retail trade, I'll use that as an example, that have been declining for this entire time period. And that's, that's the shift that's been going on for decades in the US economy, away from mom and pop, single unit establishment firms, to the large national chains like Walmart and Amazon. And we can debate about whether you think that's good or bad. Actually, it looks like it's actually mostly good in terms of the productivity statistics. So that's, you could say that's, and, and this, we, we think this largely reflects IT and globalization. That is, the large national chains were able to take advantage of IT in terms of their distribution networks and globalization in terms of their distribution networks. And, and, and that's particularly why Walmart and Amazon have done, and, and other uh, large national chains have done so well. But you can also see there's a couple of sectors, some really critical sectors that sort of have a hump-shaped behavior. That is in particularly the high-tech sectors of the US economy, by that I mean Primarily high tech in this is information technology kind of sectors. So I literally break out the information, which is a subsector of high tech, and then high tech includes also something called professional scientific and technical services or some components of that. And you can see, again in the left panel, to start, because this is economy wide, there was a surge in young business activity in the high tech sector in the 1990s. It got peaked around 2000, dot com boom and bust, and then has been declining uh, pretty. Uh, substantially since then. This, this looks less benign, although we don't fully understand that. Why do I say that is productivity in the United States surged in the 1990s, particularly around the mid-1990s and through about 2005 and has been quite low since then, by the way, particularly in the high-tech sectors, which is, surprises the people in the high-tech sector. So when I, by the way, when I was giving these kind of talks, I wasn't obviously talking about the surge, I was talking about the decline in up through 2019, literally showing this kind of evidence, I often would find myself with, in audiences uh, where particularly folks from the Silicon Valley were represented and they say, this can't be right. Uh, there, there must be something wrong with your data and, and, and maybe what you're telling me is what's going on in the nation, but the Silicon Valley is, is roaring as usual. So on the right panel, I'm sh actually showing you what's nice about this data it's actually, this is just public domain data. You can just download this from the web, this, this nice data set. Uh, I'm showing you for the Silicon Valley, the county, basically San Jose County. Uh, I'm showing you the share of activity in young businesses uh, in, 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 uh, in, in that county over this period of time in the information sector, which is, which is where uh, software publishers are where lots of this activity, not all of it, is concentrated. Actually, what's remarkable about it is the surge in the share of employment in the Silicon Valley, it, it actually, you know, it reached upwards of 40%, which is sort of remarkable, right? That basically, you know, all the, by the way, this is essentially saying the big tech today was not big tech then, they were the young tech in the 1990s, right? But, but you can see it's plummeted. And so, uh, you know, especially, you know, when, once we got into the mid to late 2000s, it's been low. So entrepreneurship was down and, and, and lots of us, myself, in particular, I've been trying to figure out why and what's going on and the consequences. And this was also a period of time, as I, no I noted, productivity growth was sluggish. And so lots of us have been thinking about the adverse consequences of the 
kind of the decline in dynamism, decline in entrepreneurship, and the sluggish productivity growth. So now let's turn to the pandemic and through today. So I just told you, you might say, well, how, how are you telling me anything about the pandemic? Because you just told me the gold standard data only goes to 2020. Well, actually, census has helped develop a new database that I actually had hand in, which is a forward looking database about new business formation. It's actually data they've been, they've been getting for decades. And we, a, a group of us at Census and, and uh, academics like myself, convinced them to produce a new data product. It's called the Business Formation Statistics. You can go download it from the web too. So what is the BFS? It's applications for new employer identification numbers. And you, you know, that sounds like very bureaucratic, but it turns out that's a necessary condition to become an employer business. If you're gonna become an employer business and unless you're completely off the books, you have to have an employer identification number. And there's lots of information on that form. And by the way, since this was been getting it for decades, uh, and, and what, what were they using it for? It was actually, they were using it to help build their business register. It was the first signal that new businesses were being formed and they were building their business register. They were contacting these businesses and so on. So they were using it for administrative purposes. And we said, wait a second, it's a great data source. Uh, and, I'll, I, and I'll try to help explain how great a data source it is in, in just a second, but a great data source in, in, in by itself. So I'm gonna focus on the, it turns out there, there are all kinds of business, excuse me, applications for EINs that come in, and I'm gonna focus only on those that are for business purposes. Like, the, so some of you, you know, there, it might be that you, you file for particular tax purposes or liens or estates or actually financial instruments have an EIN. They've all been cleared out of this, uh, out of the BFS, it's just in the public domain product and also in the, in the microdata. So what's very nice about the application, it's a pretty simple application, it can, it can be done electronically, is there's, there's a, they ask a lot of questions. They ask, well, what, what location you're in, what's your legal form of organization, they ask what industry you're working in, and then they ask why you're doing this, and that turns out to be really powerful because they ask questions enough that, we, that, that Census is able to decompose the application series into those that intend to become employers. They're signaling, they literally, one of the questions is, I plan to hire workers, <laughs> okay? And that turns out to be a really powerful piece of information. And then uh, you could say, well, what, what are these businesses that aren't trying to hire employers? It turns out in the United States, if you're not aware, and I'll show you a little bit of this in just a second, is actually most businesses in the United States don't have employees, there's roughly, uh, you know, upwards of 30 million uh, businesses in the United States. By that I mean that, that literally file some sort of business tax report, including maybe Schedule C, maybe lots of you file Schedule C. Um, and only about, about uh, uh, 6 million of those have employees. So most businesses aren't. Now these non-employer businesses aren't so important for GDP and total employment. That's not where the job creation and business activity put it. But given even the theme of what you're about this year, Self-employment activity is an, is an interesting and important way of, uh, of, of workers uh, working. And if indeed there's a surge in that going on too, we're interested in that just in terms of the changing composition of the workforce. So with that background in mind, what do you, what, I mean, one more key remark. The key thing about the applications for new EINs is it flows in in a real time basis to the Census Bureau. They get it weekly for the previous week. So they get it so quickly that they, they actually turn out, one of the statistics I'm only gonna do monthly today, that they, they release a report on Thursday of each week for the previous calendar week. And the monthly series, I'm showing you here through March 23, 2023, it, it's released within essentially 10 to 15 days of the end of the reference weeks. So it's one of the most timely indicators we have in the US economy. And it's inherently forward looking, right? Because these are, these are folks who are thinking about, uh, that's why I said a parent, thinking about creating a business. So what I want you to see is you can see that in the pandemic especially, there was a decline initially, right? And then this enormous surge, just off the chart surge, which caught all of us by surprise. And then as we, as we look further, further, it started to decline and we thought, oh, you know, the, 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 that surge was very much, well, we have lots of time on our hands and people were thinking about changing their lives and then things started to come back to normal. But then it, then it picked up again. And, and now it's sitting at a, at a new level that's, uh, depending upon which component, 
you can, again, you can decompose this, these applications into likely employers, you know, planned wages and so on, and then the non-employers. And all of the series have gone up a lot. Now, you, you, you might say, I, I, think you just, I thought you just told me there was this big decline in employer businesses during pre-pandemic, and that green line doesn't look so, so, uh, uh, so much of a decline. Actually, that's all scale. The scale is so huge. I'm going to show you. I'm going to, in, I'm going to focus on the scale. There's a huge decline going on in the green line. That's, that's basically the same line that, that I've showed you in the, in the previous figure. It's just it's all scale. Again, because this is related to the fact that most businesses are, are, are actually not employer businesses. So point one is it looks like there's aspirational businesses surging through 2023. Now let's focus on, I'm going to do most of my talk is going to be focused on the uh, the new employer businesses. So I'm going to focus on those that have signaled they want to hire employees. And, and, I, and I want to emphasize, even before I get into this particular figure, actually most of them don't make it. So it's less than 50% make it. But the connection between applications, the, 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 the variation, are very tightly related. So a simple way to do that is to put them on index uh, basis. So both of these series, one series is literally the series you just saw before. Now you can see on this scale, on this index basis, that in the Great Recession, the, the likely employer applications fell by 30%, right? That's a big number. That's a big decline. And then, then essentially did not recover, right, uh, and, and all the way through 2019. And then there's this huge surge. And again, now in terms of the green line, the likely employers were 30% higher than we were in 2019. That's a, that's a big number. Now, the nice part about the fact that this data comes into the Census Bureau, remember they're using it to build their business register, is Census can follow those applications and say, oh, did they ever go hire employees? So actually part of the data you can download, you know, literally right now if you went to the BFS on your phone, uh, is, uh, is, is actual transitions from these, tra by transitions I mean they track the application, and then they look over the next eight quarters and say, did they hire any workers over the next eight quarters? And the black line is exactly that series. And so you can see the black line, the actual startups that emerge from these applications, tracks the likely employers incredibly well. The correlation is 0.93. If I, if I do what economists, mostly economists in this room, the elasticity of actual startups with respect to applications is close to one, a 10% rise in in uh, applications that are likely employers leads to essentially a 10% rise um, in, in, in startups. Now, why does the black line only end in 2018? It ends in 2018 because remember this is two years out and I told you that we only have the gold standard data through 2020. But the, but the relationship's so tight and there's all this information in the form, census turns out a projection and it's not based upon just a simple aggregate uh, projection. They use all the all the micro data. So the dash line is is the projected startups. And so I could stop the talk now and say and and say there's been a remarkable surge in projected startups. But we'd like to kind of we'd like to dig further. We'd like to say okay okay what's really going on? And what I'm about to go do is tell you about a bit about those startups. And then you could say the beginning evidence that actually there's a huge surge in actual new businesses hiring workers in the United States and where they are and what type they are. So before I do that, uh, the, uh, I want to quickly mention that, that and, and, and I'd be happy to talk about this in, uh, in, you know, privately with you or in, in the questions or whatever, is we don't want to neglect these applications for non-employers. It, it, it turns out there's more of them and there's been this huge surge and there is, a, again, just like the, a, a tight relationship between the applications for employers and actual startups, there's a very tight relationship between applications for, that, that look to be non-employers and, 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 and non-employers. So that's, I'm going to put that aside and, and, and won't come back to it, uh, although I might remember it, uh, to talk about it on my last slide. All right. So first, let me just tell you a little bit about these applications, the surge. So interestingly, it's in some particular industries. So it turns out that there's, you know, uh, what's called three-digit industries, and it, there's, there's five of them that account for about 50% of the increase. And they're kind of what you might expect in, in, given the pandemic. A key one is we call non-store retailers, basically e-commerce, just this enormous surge 
in e-commerce activity. It was already growing pre-pandemic. Remember, we were, we were shopping online already pre-pandemic, but then it just took off. Another one that's taken off is a high tech sector, professional scientific and technical services. That, that's a sector, it does include accountants and lawyers, but it does also include key high tech sectors like computer systems design and various scientific research services. And just to kind of give you a sense of, of kind of key uh, firms that are in the industry, I can't, I can't tell you about that from census sources, that would be violating restrictions, but I can go to the web and ask, you literally can type in, what businesses are in sector, in sector uh, 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 541? Uh, so one business that's getting a lot of attention, maybe some of you are even using right now, uh, is OpenAI. So OpenAI is in 541, uh, with ChatGPT. Uh, so, so this is a high tech kind of center. Again, you can see that in the really, that, that was already on the growth, it surged. Lots of service kind of, I'll come back to this, lots of service kinds of industries also surged, and also truck transportation surges, not so surprising. There was a shift towards, away from services, towards a particular types of services, like, like we, didn't, we weren't going on vacations as much, uh, not on airlines as much, as, and we were buying lots of goods, and so for at least a period of time, uh, a truck uh, rose. We also see, oh, and just, just more generally, we see, you know, say, well, gee, well, t tell me more about this. We see if you use a, 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 an index of how concentrated the things are, what this is called the Herfindahl Index, I won't go into the technical details, is concentration of applications has increased. We've also seen uh, uh, quite distinct spatial patterns in terms of where the surge is. What I'm, gonna, what I'm also gonna show you when I look at the spatial patterns is I'm gonna show you basically the growth pre-pandemic through the pandemic through 2021. Why only 2021? The county level data in the public domain isn't quite out yet. So given I'm in North Carolina, you can see what one remarkable thing going on is the South has done remarkably well in terms of business formation, including the state of North Carolina. And I think if you look carefully, including the, the, the research triangle area. I, I don't have a slide, I should have prepared a slide. I, I, I have the data on, on your MSA, or CSA as the case might be. Uh, Georgia's done re remarkably well. But, and, 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 and so, 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 so you, there, there's clearly some interesting spatial patterns that again, your eyes are drawn to the south, but it's actually very interesting to drill down on individual cities because there's a, there's a distinct pattern going on in cities in the United States and it's related to, I think, the changing structure of the US economy. So now let's drill down on a couple of cities and let's, let's focus first on New York. That's sort of the poster child for all this. So look at the right panel. So these are all the counties part of the, the New York uh, MSA. And you can see we've drawn an arrow here for Manhattan. So, Remember, there's a surge in applications all over the country. And then interestingly, in the New York metropolitan area, not in Manhattan. Now, especially, I don't show you this, but we, in, in our work, I should have mentioned this is joint work with Ryan Decker. It was on my first slide, I apologize to Ryan, uh, is, uh, is if I look pre-pandemic and if I just ranked the counties within the New York metropolitan area in terms of where the most business formation was occurring, applications per capita, I'm controlling for population, it was Manhattan. But, but as we moved into the, into the, to the surge in pandemic, it's not Manhattan. It's interestingly, there's a donut effect as we call it. It's the county surrounding Manhattan. Some of them very close by, you can see the two very close by, Queen, if you know the New York area, Queens and Brooklyn, but also some of the surrounding uh, kind, of, kind of counties. All right, and that pattern emerges over and over again. I'm just showing you one other MSA. I'm actually showing you the whole state in this case, uh, the state of Washington, but that's also true for King County where Seattle is. But if I showed you, it's, it's in our work, I can send it to you, uh, it's in Los Angeles, it's in San Francisco, it's in Atlanta. There's donut, this pattern of, there's business formation going on. Now, let me pause just briefly f um, for a bit. You know, what do I think partly is going on? I'm gonna come back to this is the daytime population is spending, their, the daytime working population is increasingly not spending their time in areas like downtown Manhattan or downtown Washington or downtown San Francisco. Instead, they're, they're, spend, they're spending all over the country, but, it, but oftentimes they didn't necessarily move. They're, they're spending at least a couple of days a week at home. Now, these folks still like to go do things like eat lunch, go to the gym, uh, get their hair cut and so on. So we actually have seen 
uh, an, an increase in things like food and accommodation and personal services and those kinds of businesses. But we've also seen a surge in more of the high tech kind of businesses all kind of come back. So part of, I think, this spatial uh, variation in business formation is the changing daytime population where we're, we're restructuring where we are. Inner cities, we know, are downtown areas. I don't know so much about what's going on in Raleigh and, and so on. I don't know whether Raleigh has this effect, but, but if you go to downtown DC, it's a different place right now than it was in, in February 2020. That's certainly true in, in San Francisco and so on. And, and we're not the only ones to say that, of course. You know, we know that office occupancy rates remain quite low uh, in, in those areas. And, and interestingly, the business formation data very much are consistent with that and, and with this donut effect in the surrounding areas. Now, so far, this is all aspirational. You might say, this is really interesting. It looks like people are thinking about creating businesses in new places and in new industries, is it actually happening? So here's, what, here's, here's the dilemma. This business formation data is incredibly timely, right? Literally through last week or through last month. The actual data, like the gold standard data I just told you is only through March 2020. So then we're gonna go, you could say beg, borrow, and steal as much data as we can from other sources to try to see, you know, are we seeing, you could say the green shoots in the data that, that tell us things are going on? The answer is yes. So I'm gonna use a whole variety of data sets. You know, I'm full of acronyms today and, and hope mostly pay attention to the concepts, not the acronyms for the data. So one very helpful data set that's, that's useful is not out of the Census Bureau, it's out of another, another data set you could download literally today, is the Business Employment Dynamics data set out of BLS. It's, it's, it's similar in concept to the BDS. It's actually more timely though. It's, it's actually off of the, what's called the QCW system, the, the filing for uh, unemployment insurance taxes at the state level. And BLS processes this on a pretty timely basis. It's like a nine month lag. And so the data currently goes through the third quarter of 2022, which isn't bad, right? And actually that's pretty good for us. And so, 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 so I'm now showing you uh, that data. And I'm, one series you've already seen, that's the applications data. And what I'd really like is firm bursts, truly firm bursts, right? We can kind of be persnickety about this. Like a, it's a new entity and it doesn't belong to another firm. But, but, but we don't quite have that data yet. What we do have is new establishments. We know they're brand new establishments. We know they're not reopenings. Uh, uh, but, but they could be new establishments of existing firms, and there's nothing we can do about it. But still, it's pretty striking to us that how, you know, on the left panel, I'm showing you the application series that you searched before, and then, and then with a lag, and, and this, is, this is part of the interesting part of the application process, we find new businesses tend to form within four to eight quarters of the application process. So there's a nascent period, which is, I could talk quite a bit about. I'm actually gonna give a talk tomorrow in the finance department about that. Um, so we do see, you can see on the, on, the, on, the, on the left panel, you can see there's, there's quite a surge in new establishment bursts. And then if I, take, if, I, if I back out to 2004 through the present, you can see, oh yeah, these two series line up reasonably well. Not perfectly well, they shouldn't in some sense, given the fact that I, I, I want to emphasize, when I talked about employer startups, everything up to this point, they were truly new firms. They weren't new establishments of existing firms. So I'm mixing the two right here. Now, you might say, well, look, if, I, if I'm going to look at establishment in, entry, new bursts, I'd also like to look at establishment exit. And again, to BLS's great credit, they take exactly the same data, and they, they track not only establishment bursts, which I've already told you about, and, that, and, and is repeated here, but they, tra they, they track establishment exits. And why is that? And, 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 they, and again, they're very careful about this. And so the, notice that the orange series ends before the green series. Why is that? Because the, there's actually a fair amount, particularly, by the way, in the pandemic, of businesses that temporarily close and then reopen. So they have a different series called opens and closings. And how, and how do they tell a, a business, an opening is a birth? They look in the data and they say, oh, this business did not have payroll last quarter. It does this period. Did it ever have payroll in the past? If it did, then it's a reopening. If it didn't, it's a birth. Same flip side on the exit side, but now they have to look forward, right? So they see an establishment. It doesn't report its, its unemployment insurance taxes this, this quarter. They know it's closed down, but they wait to determine that it's exit. They, they wait until they see that for four quarters, the business hasn't, hasn't exited. So that's where they are in series. So you can see, by the way, there was an enormous surge 
in business exits right in the pandemic, but actually kind of interestingly, it fell off and it's starting to creep back up. If we had time, we might talk about that. The main thing I wanna talk about is now we'll go to the right panel, which shows you not only the, you know, everything so far as all counts, you might say, well, see, is, does this matter for the US economy? Oh, these are all these tiny businesses. Maybe these are all these little the mice, the, the big guys drive stuff. So on the right panel, we're literally showing you the employment gains and losses, as the case might be, from establishment entry and exit. So notice, as we moved into the pandemic, or as we moved into, uh, in, into 2021, that's really when you should start to see the, the new businesses show up. It's been a million do jobs per quarter. So since, since the second quarter of 2020 to a million jobs, a million, that's a big number in terms of, this is not annualized, on a quarterly basis, one million new jobs have been added to the US economy from establishment births. That's, that's actually a remarkable number, suggesting this has uh, important quantitative implications. So this is kind of evidence one, yeah, this business formation, these applications, this isn't just pie in the sky ideas that people sort of had in mind because they had too much time in their hand, they're actually starting up on new businesses. Um, we also see that uh, the places where the industries where these openings are occurring uh, are also the places where the applications are. Here, by the way, again, this is where the data limitations uh, 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 cause us problems. The nice thing is BLS releases, most of you were the stat agency, you know, sometimes they release some data at the aggregate level, they don't release at the disaggregated level. So they release the openings and closings data at the aggregate level, the births and deaths at the at, at aggregate level. And then when we get down to the industry level, just the openings and closings, which means now I'm stuck with, with, with reopenings in the data. Still, we find a pretty strong relationship. You know, you can see uh, uh, tech sectors like 541, for example, playing uh, a big role, uh, like we saw. You can see the information sector. You can see 454, which is the, uh, the e-commerce playing a big role. So not perfect correlation, but given the kind of the noisiness in the apples to oranges, we regard this as, as uh, as interesting. So then I want to I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the geographic aspect. And before I do that, uh, you know, another cut of the data. It, it, you could say, didn't you, haven't you already sort of shown this? But it's sort of just, just useful to kind of put it in perspective. Uh, if if this surge is going on and we're really getting new businesses, shouldn't we see an increase in the number of businesses in the U.S. economy? And the answer is, yeah, we do. We see actually kind of a remarkable surge in the net employment, not net, net growth rate of establishments. So there, there are many more establishments in 2022 than there were pre-pandemic, okay, because of these really high growth rates. Now, last kind of theme I'm gonna talk about is, let, let's remember I, I wanted to emphasize the idea that a key part of this is the spatial reallocation of activity. And are we seeing the applications show up in the spatial reallocation of, of businesses and also how workers are working? And the answer is yes. So the first thing I'm gonna do is it turns out this, again, I'm, I'm moving across data sets. I'm using what's now called the QCW data, also out of BLS, which has county level information about employment and, and establishments. And I'm basically asking the question, pre-pandemic to pandemic, is it the case, the x-axis is, is it the case the places that had a big surge in applications per capita also had a big surge in the, I just told you that in the aggregate, we have this huge surge in Establishments, yeah, actually it's a pretty strong correlation, uh, highly statistically significant. So basically I'm saying, yes, the places with new applications, I see especially big increase in a net establishment growth. I also see that this holds, if I go down, to, drill down to, the, to like the MSA level. So if I go to New York and literally use the QCW data, it doesn't look exactly like it, but if I compare the two, the donut effect is showing up in terms of net establishment growth. So you know, you know, what's, what's the method to my madness here? It's we had these aspirational businesses. Are we seeing it in various indicators? We're seeing it in terms of establishment births. We're seeing it in terms of net establishment growth. The, the last part, and then I'll just spend time, very brief time to kind of, kind of sort of summarizing, is, is another thing that's been going on that's gotten a lot of attention in the pandemic is, you know, and it, it got a label, I think, which 
hopefully it's nobody in this room that came up with this label, but, but it, which, which got a lot of attention, but I think was a little bit of a misnomer. It's called the great resignation, right? So what's true is, and, and I want you to pay attention particularly to the green series here. There's a series out of the BLS. They do a survey. Everyone's called the Job Opening Labor Turnover Survey, Labor Turnover Survey, and it, it tells us about quits. And you can see that the green line really surged in the pandemic. And, and so people were quitting, at, you could say, at literally at unprecedented rates, literally the highest over the, over the figure I'm showing you, but the, the jolt state only goes back to the early 2000s. It's actually the highest you know, on record. And so this got designated, you know, what are all these people, the great resignation. And the, why is it a misnomer? It, you know, it, made it, it, it might've made it sound like that people were leaving the labor force. That's actually not what was going on. It's actually a better label, I think. It's also gotten some traction. It's the great reshuffling. And that is people were quitting jobs and taking other jobs, including starting up businesses. So they were doing something else. So here I'm showing you, but on the, the green line, I'm showing you the series I've already shown you, the establishment bursts and the applications for likely employers, and they all track each other. But you always, you know, macroeconomists always are get into trouble if we just say, we have a bunch of aggregate time series and they all look like they're correlated. You're like, okay, everything's moving in the same direction. I don't know what the causality is, what the relationship is, and so on. And I'm not gonna resolve causality here, but I, I can drill down. And the way I'm gonna drill down is it turns out there's another series. By the way, jolts, you'd love to have jolts at the county level, but jolts doesn't release at the county level. So I, so I come up with a proxy for quits. It turns out there's another data. You say, gee, how many data sets are you using here? So I'm using another data set that's called the quarterly workforce indicators. I know actually some of you are using the quarterly workforce indicators. What? So we've long known that a pretty good proxy for quits, and you can see this here, is you go take the data at the, literally at the establishment level, and you take the difference between how many workers left the establishment, that's total separations, and how much that establishment was shrinking. And there's a tight relationship between, what we call, that, that's job destruction. There's a very tight relationship between job destruction and layoffs, we've, we've documented that over here. So the gap between the two is basically quits. So an indirect measure of quits is separations minus job destruction. And you can see they track each other pretty well at the aggregate level. So why is that relevant? Why is that helpful? Because I can, I can get this at the county level. Okay, so, so I take this QWI excess separation series, and again, I go look, it's, it's sort of like the NES, I go look to see, is it the case that places where applications were surging, that quits were also surging? And this is an indirect measure of quits, but it's a highly correlated measure, indirect measure. It's actually even stronger than the relationship I saw before. So p p partly what's going on I think, is these new businesses are forming. They're forming, when a new business forms, almost most of the data, particularly when it's a new employer business, this is not somebody who wasn't in the labor force. It's somebody who was already working for some other business. So part of the relationship is literally a direct connection. New businesses are coming from workers quitting from other businesses, that is the entrepreneurs themselves. But we also know from other work that well, it's actually quite interesting part of young firm dynamics is young businesses are actually quite good at poaching workers from other firms, M maybe even surprisingly so, because you might say, well, gee, you're living uh, in a well-established firm, there's, there's risk involved, it's not so clear that there, it, there may be great upside potential, right? But there's, but there's chance the business is gonna fail, need pretty good chance the business is gonna fail, and it's not so clear the current earnings are so great, but still, the evidence is that young businesses tend to poach workers, like on net, they are net poachers from existing businesses. So what do I think's partly been going on? Businesses have been forming in a whole variety of sectors like I've been talking about. This is induced, this has been associated with, I should say, rather than, and it's associated with entrepreneurs starting up new businesses, quitting jobs, and then them poaching workers from other jobs. So let me just try to bring this up, bring this to close, and then we can talk about it. So, Pre-pandemic, lots of discussion, including by folks when I said that the U.S. has sort of lost its mojo in terms of entrepreneurship. It, you know, back in the 1990s, we were, we were a very entrepreneurial, dynamic economy. We seem to lose some of that 
in the, in the post-2000. Exactly why? We're still debating. You know, like economists are really good at debating what's happened in the past. Uh, I have lots of papers on that if you're really interested. We go into the pandemic and, and, and uh, we get the surprising surge in new applications. We know historically there's a very tight connection between applications and actual startups. But we worry a little bit about this. Well, the pandemic is completely different. People have, are maybe thinking about changing their life and they apply for an EIN and maybe, maybe the transitions are going to be different. So we, and by the way, in, in many ways you could say I don't, still don't know the, the full answer to that because I, I don't have the gold standard data yet. But we also see some patterns in the applications that make us think, oh yeah, this is consistent with where you would expect new businesses to be. We see sectoral reallocation towards the kind of, I'm gonna call it pandemic friendly or post pandemic friendly activity. You know, what's, the, what's the big structural change that's gone on? It's, it's closely related to working from home. It's the fact that we've learned, in spite of the word, it's nice we're all here in person, that we can do a remarkable amount remotely, right? So within businesses, between businesses, between businesses and, and, and consumers. That's changed the very structure of the economy. It's showing up in a variety of ways, including uh, uh, business formation. Interestingly, it has, as I said, it has this donut effect in, in uh, major cities. You know, it, then the big question is, is this aspirational restructuring in terms of industry and geography actually happening? You could say the verdict's still out a little bit, but I'll just come back to the, the statistic that really strikes Wright and I. A million jobs a quarter coming from establishment births, way up compared to before. We think that that's very much consistent uh, 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 with this pattern. So last slide, I think I'm about on time. Uh, it will take some time for us to figure this out. Part of it is data lags, right? So in me, like the gold standard data, well, this fall, the data through 2021 will be released by the Census Bureau for true startups. We'll learn a lot when they release that data. Uh, but, it's, but it's more than just data lags, it turns out. Those of us who, there's some variety of us in this room that study young firms. What's true about young firms is they're incredibly volatile. You know, what, what's the most likely outcome for these new employer businesses? They're going to fail. Uh, many of them aren't going to grow. But what has been true in the past is and this is sort of a remarkable feature of the U.S. economy? Is is a small fraction really grow really rapidly and have, and have played a remarkable role in innovation and productivity growth historically, and that's partly why we we've, we've worried so much about the decline in entrepreneurship in the last 20 years, particularly in the parts of the economy where that kind of right tail, that really high growth activity has occurred, the high tech sectors. So. Do we think, so let's come back to the, to the you know, what, what do we make of what we've seen so far? Do we think somehow or another we're back to the 1990s? I mean, that, that was the go-go period of business formation, particularly in high tech sectors, that, that were very much associated with the boom in, uh, in, in productivity and innovation. Indeed, if you go look carefully at the data, I've got some work on this, Startups tend to lead innovation is the point. It's not so surprising, right? There's new technology developing, Startups enter an experiment. It, it's only after that experimentation phase goes on that you really start getting the productivity boost. So actually startups literally lead uh, productivity gains in, uh, in industries that go through rapid periods of innovation. So, so oftentimes, by the way, again, when, if I was giving this talk back in 2019, I, and I'd be giving talks and I'd be talking with folks like Eric Winjolson, if you happen to know his work, who's an expert on technology and innovation. And Eric's, always optimistic about the amazing things going on in technology. And so a lot of the, this discussion, by the way, back then was about, we're all about to have self-driving cars. Well, we've seen what's happened with that. But anyway, um, uh, but, but he was just talking about all the different kinds of innovations going on. And I would say to him, yeah, 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 I, I understand the labs are doing all kinds of great things and firms are doing great things in terms in their labs, in their R&D labs. But, but where are the startups? In some sense, the startups are both both create the innovation, but they're induced, they're drawn to it. It's not surprising, right? If you're thinking about, particularly if you're, you're aspirational to do something big, where it's like, uh, you know, well, why did John Dillinger rob banks? That's where the money is. Why, why do the startups, the aspirational startups go to the innovative sectors? Because that, that's where the innovation is. So I, I'd say to him, where is that? So, so do I think there's a resurgence of that going on? Yeah, I think maybe a little bit. I actually think that the fact, 
What, what's the, my best evidence of that? It's still too early to say that the sector 451, uh, 541, excuse me, the professional scientific and technical services has really taken off. But I also think some of this is, it's still important, it's, it's the spatial reallocation activity. I, again, I, don't, I, I think over that, that working from home is here to stay. And by that I mean not five days a week, but some days a week. I don't know what it's like for the faculty and the students here. And Maryland, by the way, one way of seeing it is, it's now the case, even though we teach classes on whatever, you can always find a space in the faculty park parking lot, no matter what day it is. <laughs> so things have changed, okay. So some of it's just the restructuring activity, and it's not surprising businesses restructure. So last remark, and I, I, I will bring this to a close, is, is I think it's apparent there is this, this brand new surge of young businesses. And, and, they're, and they're different. They're doing different things in locations and in industries. Now, what, what we do know historically is their young businesses, I already said they're, they're very volatile. They're very sensitive to financial markets and they're very sensitive to the business cycle. So what's a huge uncertainty is, well, the Federal Reserve's got this little problem. It's called inflation. Not such a little problem, right? So as we've come out of the pandemic, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, we're still debating inflation's really surged. And so they've been raising interest rates and, and trying to slow the economy down. If they achieve a self landing, it probably isn't going to clobber this new cohort. But if we have the recession that some people are still predicting for 2023, remember, a lot of us were predicting it for 2022 as well. But if, if you have that recession, what's one group that's going to get hit really hard? Exactly this cohort. And so you, it's, it's, it may be that the, the Federal Reserve, through with all good intentions, that's not their point. They're trying to slow down the economy, bring inflation down. There's all kinds of reasons we want to do that. But they may, they may, be, they may stifle one of the greatest booms in, in startup activity that's occurred uh, in, in a generation. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Yes, please. Super interesting stuff. Um, I, I don't know if you've looked at it, but I, I found your like, spatial results very interesting as to where the new businesses are being opened. Do you see that there are different spatial preferences in, in employees in terms of where they look to become employed? It seems like something you could look at that with the jobs. Yeah, this is re re really good. We, we were actually chatting a little bit about this in our, uh, during, during lunch. I mean, what, um, I, so one is I think the quits data is, is, is consistent with this, that we are seeing surges in quits in the same kind of locations that we're seeing uh, in, um, in terms of business formation. But in terms of literally tracking, the, the, I'll say, the, the changing residential uh, population, I, 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 we're, this, we're gonna struggle with this, right? So the ACS eventually will get out data that tells us sort of the uh, good detail in this. The Census Bureau's on top of, the Census Bureau has a data set that's, that's called the Composite Person uh, Record. <laughs> really boring name, but basically it's the administrative data that tracks literally the location of every person in the United States. Why do they have that? So they can conduct the CPS and the ACS and so on. That's the, that's the same data that goes into, for those of you use LEHD data, that's another part of census, something called the loads data, it's place of work versus place of residence. So that data will tell us this is the thing, but it, it's slow to process. So one of the big dilemmas, I mean, basically my answer is, we don't really have the data on, a, on as timely a basis as we'd like yet. Like loads is, is 20, I, I'm, I think it's only 2020 itself. Um, so we're going we're gonna to be able to answer that question. When I say we, literally we as, a, as a, a research community, both with public domain data like loads and the data that's sitting at the, behind the firewalls at the agencies. But the, like the, the data that's really going to nail differences between place of work and place of residence, it's, it, takes, it takes a while to process. I mean, I, one of the things we talked quite a bit in the group just chatting at lunch was there's great demand for, what, what a surprise, we're always greedy as uh, whatever, you know, for more granular and more timely data. And you know, this is a time with this kind of restructuring going on, you, you know, both us as from the research community would like to know, but the policymakers would very much like to know, okay, how, how is this happening? And, and the fact that the data is, a, you know, 2021 is ages ago at this point, right? So the, the answer is we don't know yet. 
Yes, please. Yes. Um, how should we think about non-employer work? So I'm thinking like sort of gig work. Because yep. with these startups, you know, new business models might be relying more on that. Yes. Absolutely. I think that that's a, that's a huge question going on. So let me talk a little bit about the gig economy and what, what we've seen before pandemic and then what I think we're seeing now. And again, the, so what we're seeing now is all speculative. It's basically from the BFS. So I spent a fair amount of time trying to track the gig economy uh, pre-pandemic and I tracked it through 2019 with literally what's called the non-employer data. It's like literally everybody who has a non-employer business. It's all the, all the sole proprietorships, all the partnerships, all the corporations. We literally have the universe of that business. And it's been growing pretty steadily over the, over the post-2010 period. But if you really look where the growth is, and this is gonna be a surprise to you when I say it, there's one industry that just took off. And what industry is that? It's the taxi and limousine service industry. It's basically the ride-sharing industry. So, so there's been an enormous increase in that industry, just phenomenal. Like, like it went from about 200,000 to over a million. Okay, so like a million increase. And that accounts for a large fraction of the pre-pandemic growth. But now we've seen even, lar can I say, relative to the, if you look carefully at the charts I showed in terms of the applications for new non-employers, the, the increases we've seen in the pandemic dwarf what we saw over that decade. And, and they're not, especially in the taxi and limousine service industry, okay? So unlike that period of time that, you know, I, I can't quite remember what exactly what it's 485, I think. And not that I, I should memorize the NAICS thing, but it's, it's in, the, in the 48s. It's not been there. That's not a, that's not a, it's not a, you know, the ride sharing is doing okay. Actually, they, they struggled a bit for a while, right? Not surprising, we were all staying at home, so we weren't riding Uber as much. So I, I think they're doing fine now, but, but th this is not a place where I think we're searching. The fact that 541 has been one of the key sectors, I didn't surely show you that, where likely non-employers has especially taken off. I, I think individuals have figured out they can go out on their own. And so if, if, once you've figured out you can do all this remotely, you're like, well, wait a second, why do I necessarily need to be an employee of this big corporation? I can actually go out on my own, essentially be an independent contractor now, there are, there are costs of that, right? You're gonna to cover your insurance, all this kind of other good stuff that's important. But I, but I, I, I think that that's going on. And so, uh, again, we don't fully know yet, you know? So um, the, the, the best data sets tracking non-employer activity are even slower than the data sets tracking employer activity. There's nothing like the BED for non-employers. You might say, by the way, some of you might say, wait, wait a second, there's the CPS. And, with all due respect to the CPS, the CPS we've discovered is unfortunately having tr has trouble tracking, I'm going to call it uh, secondary and supplemental activity. It's just not so good at that. Um, so I've got some big project with Catherine Abraham where we've literally linked the micro records of the CPS to this non-employer data. And we, we find that remarkably something like uh, of the, of the non-employers, who actually, you know, literally filed a tax return, said they had self-employment activity, and who are also in the CPS. So we literally found them in the CPS, so whatever. 70% of them report they have no self-employment activity in the CPS. So and you say, well, are people lying? No, actually, I think partly, this is the, and the question whether this has changed, but I say particularly the right sharing is a good, good example. I think lots of self-employment activity, we've known this for a while, is secondary, it's supplemental, it's stopgap. You have, a, you have a main job, and you're also doing something on the side. You get laid off, you do something for a while, and then you get another wage and salary job. So, and, this, and, and the CPS is, struggles with that. The CPS is, is, I'll say, reasonably good. I'm not gonna say very good, but reasonably good at getting your main activity. But let's, I don't know, whatever here. If, if you're in the CPS this month, and particularly this is applied to the students, and they ask, what, what do you do? You probably say you're a student. If they ask you whether you're working, you might say, no, I'm not working. Even though you actually have a job, you might be being paid as a graduate student or a TA or whatever, you might not say that because well, that's secondary. You might even be associated with you being a student. Or you have a second job because actually you want, you want to supplement your income to be able to pay for going to, going to school. And so again, I think, this, I think the surveys struggle getting all that. So that, 
So th this is a, this is a um, let me come back to your original question. The question is whether non-employer activity has changed in, the, in this period of time to become more of a main activity. Are, are we seeing people literally, as I've talked about, going out on their own, and, and a larger share, I'm going to say, of particularly 541 or individuals, this is, this is their primary activity. This is not just supplemental. And, and, the, we, and unfortunately, we've got the BFS data, which is like yesterday, and the gold standard data for telling us what's actually going on, I'll ha we'll have in a couple years. I mean, I, by the way, you've noticed there's a repeated theme here. Uh, I don't know yet, we'll know in two years kind of thing. But this, you know, welcome to economic measurement. Yes, please. Yeah, so I don't know if, if you remember the state of Washington, there were some places that weren't particularly close to Seattle where we also sort of saw surges. I don't, we haven't done enough on that yet, is the point is, to what extent you know, has, has this enabled people to, you know, th this has always sort of been the dream, by the way, of the internet, right? Oh, I can locate anywhere, right? And then, and, uh, and then work, and whatever. And the question is whether the pandemic, partly, you could say it was a necessity that we work remotely, we figure out, wait, wait a second, we can literally live anywhere uh, and, and work. Now, related to earlier questions, and I, I know, you know, what, what I know most actually is, <laughs> because uh, I, I hang out and work with the Census Bureau. Census Bureau has staff, and they, they know about it, whatever, who are working, you know, they are reported as working in Suitland, Maryland. They're all over the country. Not all of them, but they, but they literally change their, their, their working location, because they actually, because Census, they, they have access to proprietary data, so they log in from the, a secure location, their home and whatever. So, so some of what I think is going on, that's not in the business formation statistic, that's just people and, and some of you have been asking, okay, the first question, where are people working versus where they're living? An interesting question is whether we've seen individual startup businesses in remote locations because they figured out, wait a second, I can actually make this work even though I'm not, I'm not, in, the, I'm not in, the, in the hub, right? Has it, has it changed the nature of clustering that we see? Really big and interesting question. So we'll, you could say, well, give us lots to work on over the next decade. So really interesting question, yeah. Uh -huh. And I don't know if you've thought about like the stimulus checks yes. or the fact that there was a pause. And, and, and I think that's important because that could suggest that the marginal quality of startups is lower. Or PPP, right? Or, yes. Actually, I, let, me, let me handle those real quickly. I think PPP worked against this. Why? And I've got two, two parts of it. One in theoretically and then one empirically. So PPP was for businesses that existed in February 2020. So... I'm all about businesses that didn't exist. So if you think about what, theoretically, if you, if you deter shutdowns, that deters entry. So that's, that's basic theory. Now, you, you still might have wondered, this, there still could have been an, uh, a relationship with the, and it's the following. It turns out PPP did allow um, individuals who were self-employed to get PPP loans, even sole proprietors. And it did turn out not, <laughs> I didn't want to go through all the technical details. If you're a sole proprietor, probably if you file Schedule C, maybe many of you, I file Schedule C, I don't have an EIN. You don't need one. But as soon as you start having a more regular kind of business, having an EIN as sole proprietor is really valuable. It turns out if you, have, you want to have a business bank account, you need an EIN. And it turns out for PPP loans, a, a business bank account was really helpful. So lots of people speculated that you, know, you saw a huge spike in, in July 2020, you're like, okay, these are people who applied for PPP loans, got them, now started having the filing requirements, needed bank accounts. So Census was worried about this. Here's the good news, and I, I, I can say this because they released this publicly. They, the good thing is SBA literally tracked every PPP loan. It's a, it's a, you can actually go download it from, from SBA website. So they matched it. There was almost no connection. Okay, so, so so I don't think, PPP, I think, if anything, theoretically and empirically, is not involved. On the other hand, stimulus checks, this, this enormous, I mean, providing lots of cash, uh, literally cash, or resources, plus cash, to people 
who were rethinking things. I think that's an interesting question as to whether, you know, what, what that did and what that did to the nature of businesses. Now, here's where I'm going. I think an interesting question is whether the surge in 2020 is different than, the, than what's going on now. All that's long since gone, right? And we're still seeing, because so lots of people were kind of asking literally both of your questions and saying, this is all gonna go away because it had to do with too much time on our hands, lots of stimulus, et cetera. Here we are in March 2023, and we're still 30% higher than 2019. And I think those, those factors have gone away. So, 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 I, so I think there's a, that, that's where this restructuring story kicks in. Still an interesting question. Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate this um, for your insights, for being a distinguished fellow. Um, thank you all for attending, uh, and I hope you continue to visit the King Institute website to look at the research that we're doing. Um, also, keep your eyes out. In late August, we're going to re return for, with our, our next set of distinguished fellows, so keep your eyes out for that and for our analysis on these, on these issues and our grand challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you.